get up here. So, well, God is good, and, and we thank him. I, I want to turn in the Bible to Psalms 119 and 11. Psalms 119 is, a, is the longest chapter of the Bible. And I want to re- I want to read verse eleven of Psalm one nineteen. Very short scripture, but I think one we'd all know. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I think the greatest spiritual warfare that any of us will ever face is within our own heart or our own mind. The thing that we realize in life is that is to allow God to transform us is, is, is a yielding process. And many times we, the pain can be pretty severe when God is working in our lives. We are certainly at war. It is a spiritual war. The biggest part of this war is fought in our own hearts. As I said earlier, the psalmist knew that he who controlled his heart would win. The Bible says that he takes out the heart of stone and he replaces it with a heart of flesh. What is that heart of flesh for? To receive an impression. You can't put an impression in a stony heart. So God has to do a heart transfer in each one of us as we come to know Jesus Christ. And and we have to realize the Bible says the human heart is desperately wicked and who can know it? Let me tell you this. If you think that you're good outside of God, you are deceiving yourself. For all have sinned and come short of the of the glory of God. Each one of us have come short, and we need to realize that. I was listening to a preacher the other day, and he was preaching the word, and he came out with a lot of good things. But after he got done preaching, I felt empty, and I couldn't understand why. So I began to listen to some of it over again, and, and what I realized in this is that his doctrine gave no margin for failure. And I want to tell you this right now. I believe God gives us margin for failure. He gave Peter margin for failure. He gives you and I margin. And sometimes we do fail. The Bible said that Jesus said to Peter, he said, you'll deny me before the cock crows. That morning, he is saying, I don't know. I don't know this man and so on. And after he had denied him the three times, the cock crow, And he knew, he remembered the words of the Lord, and the Bible said that Jesus turned and looked at him. And he ran out into the wilderness, and he wept bitterly. What we have to realize in this is without God, we can't do it. See, pride can set in, and all of a sudden, we we do something, and, and it works, and we become overconfident in that, and what happens is, is, the Bible says that that's where a fall comes. Because God wants to remind us, it's him that, does, that has to do the work. He said, unless God built the house, it's what? Done in vain. It's built in vain. Uh, does that mean we don't trust him and, and go forward? So, so we see here uh, in the word is... Uh, to not sin. Considering all that Jesus had done for us, his past love, greater love had no man than this, how much love does it take for a man to give up his very life? You know, the Bible said to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, which is a reasonable service. That's powerful. Amen. That's powerful. And, and that's what God wants for each one of us, is that we'll say, Lord, no longer... I love what the apostle said, and I said this uh, two weeks ago. I said, um, you know, the one apostle said, it's no longer I that live, but it's Christ that lives in me. So we say, Lord God, I surrender. But Father, without you, I cannot accomplish what you have put before me. Amen. And that's where, um, as Barbara 
uh, this morning was saying that God was saying it's time to leave and it's time to go. How many of us believe it's time to get busy for the Lord? I believe what we do, we must do quickly because the Lord is coming very, very soon. Hallelujah. So you say, what should I do? What can I do? I don't know. What have you in the house? Amen. 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 What have you in the house? You know, I think a lot of us get this grandeur idea about ministry. I was saying to a minister uh, uh, this uh, last yesterday, and his name is Sam. He's a great pastor. And I said, you know something, Sam? I said, I, in, when I went into ministry, I envisioned thousands of people because I, I've got an ego. Isn't that awful? You know, I got an ego. An ego. I want to go out there and I want to sing and I'm going to be the next Moses or the next, next thing. And, and I said, Sam, but you know, a lot of Sunday mornings I look and I might have 20. I said, you know what I've come to the conclusion? God doesn't care about my ego. Isn't that, isn't that it? Yeah, it is. So what we realize is that, Lord, let me be faithful with what I have, right. not what I don't have. Right. Yep. Amen. That we have to realize, you know, because a lot of people, they think about ministry, and they think of something big, and they say, I'm going to wait for that. I'll tell you what. You wait for the rest of your life, but unless you're willing to step out in faith, you see, they could never inherit the, the promised land without first going through the facing of Pharaoh. They could never have, have had the promised land if they didn't face the Red Sea. They could never have had the promised land if they did not face the Jordan River. Right. You see what I'm saying? If they didn't face uh, Jericho, if they didn't face... Uh, AI, Don't you see what I'm saying? There are battles that you're going to face. And you've got to say, Lord, I am here and I am willing. But some people, what happens is they get this idea and they think that I just, I'm just going to wait for the promised land. When there's a journey involved. And each one of us need to say, Lord, I believe the steps of a good man are ordered to the Lord. I put my trust in that, and I have an ear, I pray, to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to me. I don't know what he's speaking to other people. I have people that come up with dreams, they went to heaven and all that. It doesn't mean anything to me. People change their whole direction because of somebody else's dream. i got to live in the life that God's given me. How about you? I've been to people's houses when... When they would say, you know, my, my, my son died, and I looked in the fireplace, and I saw his face, and, and, and I, I just said, hey, well, well that, that's good, but I'm not going to build a doctrine on that. My wife and I, years ago, went out to Detroit, and there was a, a, a group out there, and, and they were very loving people, but they built their whole, um, their whole faith on three men. They went up on a mountain, and they said when they came down off the mountain, they, took, they came down in two steps. And I say, yeah, that's good you came down with two steps, but I'm going to stick with the Word of God. How about you? Amen. 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 It, it, it very well might be. But see, I'm not going to follow something because it seemed miraculous. I'm going to live by the word of God. I'll tell you this right now. God wants to speak to each and every one of us in this room. God wants to speak to you more than you desire to be spoken to. But we have to be open. We have to have a right heart in which to receive him. So we consider all that Jesus uh, has done for us. I look at his past love. Greater love had no man than this. How much love does it take for a man to give up his very life, as I had spoken earlier? Jesus gave his life for you when you were yet in sin. How much more should we love those around us? You see, we're born with what is called a natural love. 
The natural love is, as we know, that if I want my parents to think good of me, I'll go and I'll shovel the driveway. Or I'll do it's a performance type of love. But I'm going to tell you, God brings a love that has nothing to do with performance. It, it's to do with his performance. Amen. He gave his life for each and every one of us. And if we would receive that, if we would understand that, and that we would love him the way that he loves us. We look at present love. The, and the hairs of your head are numbered. In other words, he cares for every intricate detail in our lives. I want to know, he cares about you. He cares about you. He cares about me. Do you know he's more concerned with you than your ministry? Do you know that Jesus would rather you make it to heaven than to have a great ministry? And I always say this, Lord, when I'm, if, if I'm in error that you would come to me, and that you would share. And I'll tell you, he is faithful. If our heart is not hardened, if our heart is open to him. Amen. But sometimes we can harden our heart. Mm -hmm. People get angry. The Bible says, rebuke a righteous man and he'll what? He'll love you. Right. He said, if you rebuke a fool, he'll hate you. And that's what we have to look at. And that's what I say in my life. Lord, let me never be a fool. Let me realize, Lord God, that I need you. I'll tell you, how much do we need him this morning? How much do we want him to speak to us this morning? And praise, when we look at Matthew 28 and 20, it says, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end. Holding fast. I said to Sam, we interviewed uh, Pastor Sam Richards yesterday. He has a prison ministry uh, for, the, uh, for the ladies up at the Kennebec uh, County Jail. And I said, Sam, how'd you get into that? Well, he said, I think I got hoodwinked into it. He said, I had a few pastors that called me and said, hey, we're going into the prison ministry. Why don't you come and join us? And Sam said, all right, I'll do that. Little did he know, within a year, all the other pastors bailed on him. But he said, I believe that you need to be steadfast. You need to be unmovable. You need to be faithful. And for 30 some years, he stood in that jail. And he speaks to the ladies. You see, that's, that's character. They're saying, Lord, I'm not going to do this today and then do that tomorrow and, and, and be wishy washy. The Bible said a man that is unsettled in his own heart is like a, a piece of driftwood tossed to the sea. What that means for each one of us is, Lord God, I am here. I'll stand. I think of Ezekiel. I was reading in the book of Ezekiel. And you know what he said to Ezekiel? He said, I want you to lay on your left side for a year. <laughs> wow. I don't. I lay on my left side, you know, for an hour and I flip. You know, that mattress gets a little hard on that side. But could you imagine how faithful Ezekiel had to be right. to lay on his left side for that long? And then after a year, he said, flip over and do another year. Yeah. I mean, Lord. But of course, you know, God doesn't tell him to do anything that doesn't have a purpose in it. But look at Ezekiel. God used him so greatly. So often we try to filter things through our own intellect. And when we hear God say something, we, we have to, uh, you know, filter this. Well, that doesn't make sense. And, and that can't be. But I will tell you something about Ezekiel. He had an ear to hear what the Spirit was speaking. Are we at that place? Are we willing to say, Lord, let my ears be open. Let me hear what you have to say. And no matter what it is you say, Lord God, that I would obey it. That's right. Moses, he's called. He's, 
At first, that uh, he's 40 years old, he thinks he's ready. And God says, no, you're not ready. He's going to put him on the backside of a desert until he has no confidence at all. And he has a speech impediment. And he has to use Aaron to speak for him. And he said, now, Moses, you're ready. And he goes against Pharaoh. And he says, tell me what I shall say. He says, say that I am that I am. How I many know oh, God does not tell us everything? But what happened is, is then he leads this, this group of, uh, I'm gonna th I think around two and a half million. I said, I think it was 800 and some thousand men. So I think if you think of children and so on, probably somewhere around two and a half million. And he leads them out by faith. Does he have the provisions to give them water? Does he have? He doesn't have anything other than the word of God. How many know the word of God is sufficient? I just need to hear what the Lord is speaking to me. What did he do? The first thing he did is he came up against the Red Sea. Impossible! And God said, take your staff and he stretched it over the Red Sea. And he did that and guess what? The seas were parted. So when I look at all of that, how much do we trust in the Lord? I look at his future love. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I think too often in life, we look at this life as precious. I love what I read this morning. He said, he said, who would you rather fear? He that can destroy your body or he that can destroy both body and soul in hellfire forever? If we think this world precious, then we're going to put it before anything else. If we think this, word, this world precious, then the things of this world will become precious. But I'm just a sojourner in a strange land. I'm just an ambassador for Christ here. I am born again to a new city. I'm born again to a new heaven. Amen. Amen. Yes. And you know what? The Bible said this, this life will flee like we wouldn't believe. He said, it said your life is like the, the blade of grass. And in the morning it gets the dew. But in the sun, in the noon sun, it withers. You see, I look in the mirror and I see things withering. Amen. And the thing that we realize by that is that's what the Bible says. Do you know this life is short? Right. What I do for the Lord is going to be much more meaningful than anything that I can accomplish in this world. Hallelujah. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, ye may be also. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one that saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land, what, what a day, what a day that will be. I don't want to hear him say, depart from me, because you didn't love me. I want you to know, I want to know him. I want to walk with him. Can a man, we have to ask, can we overcome sin? And, the, and of course the Bible teaches that we can live above sin. What does it mean to live above sin? It means to be obedient. To have an ear to hear. To be willing to say, you know what Jesus said? You talk about obedience. He said, I never speak one thing that my father hasn't first spoken to me. That is discipline. Remember what James said? He said, the tongue is an unruly member. Who can tame it? He said, a man that tames the tongue is a perfect man. Lord, help me. What did Isaiah say? He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. And the Bible said that God took a coal off of the altar and he put it upon his lips. In Romans 12, 21, it says, 
Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. It is so important. And how can you have good? The Bible says there is no good thing except for that which comes from heaven above. Wow. He said every good gift comes from heaven. I'm going to say it again. There's no good thing that did not come from heaven above. And so we realize, how do we overcome evil? With good. What does that mean? That we receive of the Lord. And it's God that strengthens us. It's God that gives us the ability to overcome in times of trials and temptations. In 1 John 4, 5 and 4, it says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Even our faith. You see, the flesh will still want to sin. Paul describes the battle against the sin in Romans 7. We all know about Romans 7, that that I was do, I do not, that I was not do, that I do. Here Paul is 40, probably about 43 years old, and he's just come into that knowledge. He's a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. He's got a PhD, a PhD in, in theology. And yet, none of that brought him to the place of Romans 7, but the born-again life. You see, when you're born again, all of a sudden you become aware. You become aware. You see, the world don't know their sin. They look at you like, what? I'm just having a good time. I'm just doing this or, or, or I'm doing that. But you realize when you become born again, God opens your heart and makes you sensitive right. Amen. to what pleases him. That's a transformation. And that's why, as God opens my heart in Romans 7, I realize that the things that I had liberty in, I don't have liberty anymore. What did Paul say? He said, he said when I was a child, I speak as a child. When I become a man, I put away childish things. He said, you know, he says, all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. And what he means by lawful is that I can take whatever I want to take, but it's not best because I know somebody who's done something better and wants something better for my Amen. life. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So often, you know, we, we look at, and I'm going to say this, every single person in this room will die with, with regrets. But don't let your regrets shape you tomorrow. Or to know this one thing. Lord God, I believe that you are able to forgive me and to keep me from all unrighteousness. The flesh will still want to sin. Paul describes the battle against sin we just said in Romans 7. In Romans 8, 1. Don't you love Romans 8? There's always something good. So there's always something great in Romans 8. Yeah. Isn't that right? Get an amen down there. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You see, I've got to be mindful of the Spirit. Lord, I want to, to, to follow the Spirit. Do I always feel spiritual? No, but with discipline. With discipline. Because I'll tell you, there are times when I don't want to pick up the Bible. There are times when... When I don't have an appetite, and that's when I'm going to say, Bob, you listen up. You need the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. And that's where the discipline comes in my life every day. Lord yes, God, yes, that yes. I will follow you and that I will serve you. I think of a power of sin which is bondage, uh, which is bondage uh, that, it ha that it can be broken. In Romans 6 and, 19, and 6 and 18, Being then made free from sin, ye become the servants of righteousness. I want to be free that I can serve him. Because I can't serve him if I'm in bondage. God wants me to be free. 
In Romans 6.22 it said, But now being made free from sin and become the servants of God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Oh, Lord, God help us. We're living in some pretty crazy times. Don't you agree with me? We're living in times when there's so many temptations. That we're living in times when that Satan seems to be barking at every door. And that's when we've got to say, Lord Jesus, I pray that I will be a true disciple. I pray, Lord God, that I will follow you. And sometimes, you know, God allows us for a while to, to, to go another way. But thank God he loves us. Amen. And his door is always open to us. The Bible said, if any man sin in John, it says, we have an advocate with the Father. What's an advocate? It's a lawyer. And he says, who is just and able to forgive you of your sin. Change my heart, O oh Lord, that I may ever be mindful of you. Those who teach that we, uh, you know, that, that we, we must sin are not looking at the solution. The solution is Jesus. And we look in Psalms 119.11, it says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's the word of God. Yeah. It's God, I want to fill my heart so much with your word that everything, the Bible said, out of my belly will what? Pursue rivers of living water. That's what the Holy Spirit comes to do. have to ask ourselves, what's in your heart? The Bible says from the from the, uh, the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you speak in negativity, I mean, we got to learn to be positive. We need to know. I believe God for my children. I believe God for my grandchildren. I come against every spiritual wickedness. I come against anything, and I bring a guard that comes from the Spirit. I mean, are you doing that, or are you just complaining? You know what I'm saying? It's very easy for me to get into a complaint. Ah, oh, you know, they just don't. Yeah, they, they, you know. My husband, you know, I eat well. Yeah. And my wife, you know, you know what I'm saying? And you get into a place of negativity. What we need to do is say, Lord, I'm going to base my emotions upon what your word is saying. Jeremiah, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, described the heart of the, of, of the wicked as deceitful in Jeremiah 17 and 9. He said, The heart is uh, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it? Okay, let's look at the human heart. The human heart, and, I, and I'll just share this with you. You know, there's somebody that's had a hard life, they've never known love, they've just had everything, and, and, and this man finds a boyfriend. And they seem so happy. See, the human heart will reach out and say, oh, at least they're happy. How many know that's not God's heart? It is, does it mean we don't love that person? We should love everybody. The Bible doesn't even love your enemies. Right. Love those who persecute you. But you see, the human heart will always rule by emotion. Emotions are fickle. Right. I can be on top of the world today and, 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 and not be tomorrow if I let my... The emotions are like a roller coaster. So we have to, by faith, say, what does God's word say? So let every man be a liar and let God's word be true. What is a lie? My emotion, if it contrary to the word of God. I know whom I have believed. I am persuaded that he... <coughs> That he is able 
Are you willing to guard your dream? Are you willing to say, I will be a watchman over what God has given me? Amen. I'm not going to let the thief steal it. The things we say, they come from our heart. And Luke 6.45, a good man out of a good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of an evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now don't think yourself to be about that. You ever watch a movie and someone robbed a bank and you're telling how they could have done it better? Yeah. <laughs> then you realize what you're doing? The heart can easily think bad things. But what we realize is, Lord, I discipline my heart from allowing it to go there. Because if I let my heart go there, I will follow it. And I said, Lord, I don't want to follow that. In Jesus' name. So, we can go to the habit of, of cursing. I want you to know that that's a heart problem. It is a sign that you are not fully surrendered to God. Because I tell you, the tongue has got to be surrendered to God. Amen. To be careful, I'll tell you, the church that I was born again in, if you even said, gosh, right. it meant something else. Right. It was softening yep. something else. Yep. I mean, the discipline mm -hmm. that, you know, that, that and we can, we can discipline our speech. You ever said something, someone that said, after what in the world's wrong with you? I did that one time. I was uh, talking with a neighbor, and, and I was talking about something, and the neighbor looked at me and said, boy, I wouldn't know half this if it weren't for you. And I'm thinking, doesn't that sound like gossip? I felt bad. I had to go back and say, Lord, forgive me. Yeah. Forgive me, Lord. You know, we, we have to say, Lord, you know, and I'll tell you, this isn't something that happens overnight. It is, it is a journey. It is a journey. David learned that journey. When he said, search my heart to see if there be, be any wicked way in me, his own heart had deceived him so many times with Bathsheba. Right. And the mess he got into with that. And we could go on with some other things. But the fact of it is, is David realized, I cannot trust my heart. I must trust him. God, expose the evil that is in me. Search, Lord God, because I don't dare, or should I say, I don't trust my heart anymore. Amen. We're to keep our heart. In Proverbs 4 and 23, it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. With all diligence, what does that mean? It means that we need, it's a priority. That I keep what God has given me because the devil will come to steal it. He comes to steal the seed. He comes to steal what God has placed in our hearts. I remember a man uh, a while back and he said that there was this teacher that he had was just superior in his teaching. He saw him 20 years later, and the man didn't even remember anything. In other words, you know what? He, he withdrew, and he went the other way, and every, every seed and every nugget that God had put in his heart was lost. Paul said, I don't know preach as if I've already attained. I realize that we're in a battle. I realize that what God has given me, the devil will try to steal. Look at Jesus. And I was reading that this morning. How the, the, the devil came to him, and every single time, what did Jesus say? I'm getting ahead of my note. But what did Jesus say? He said, it is written. Amen. Forty 
days without eating, and the, and the devil knew, he said, well, you being the child of God, of the Son of God, turn these stones into a loaf of bread. And he said, thou shalt live by the word of God. We don't live by bread only, but we live by every word that comes from the Lord. So what we realize in that is that the word of God, we get to know the word. You should know the truth, and truth what? Will make you free. I want to be free. How do I, be, how do I get free? By the word of God. But I say, Lord God, I see the direction, and Lord, I'm going to aim for the mind. Isn't that what Paul said? He said, he said I aim for the prize. So we have to say, Lord God, what am I aiming at today? The flesh wants to fill the heart with worldliness. The flesh has an appetite for sin. The flesh does, uh, says don't get too fanatical. The flesh says, oh, I know, but he's an old funny dad. Uh, there, there's a lot of liberty he's leaving out. Well, I want to tell you, liberty can lead you to bondage. Now, God does give us liberty. But he says, don't use your liberty to be entangled again into the sin. Right. Amen. In basic training, I remember in the military, in basic training, they gave us liberty. And this one guy went out and he was playing pool with somebody and he thought the guy cheated him and he took the end of that stick and he hit him right on the head till the blood squirted all over the ceiling. And then he ran, and I saw the MPs. They had flashlights. They had it cornered under one of the barracks because they were on pillars, but they didn't have a foundation. And they've got, they've got their flashlights on him like he's a raccoon. I never saw him again. Why? Because he used his liberty to get entangled again into the bondages of sin. Christians, we can do that. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful to say, Lord, that my steps be ordered of you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. In Psalms 12, 6 and 7, it says, The word of the Lord is pure word. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from generation to generation. God said, My word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. You see, when I get weak in the flesh, what I try to do is excuse away the scripture rather than to say, God, keep me strong and let me never violate your word. There are those today that believe that the word's outdated, that when it was written, that it was written in a, in a, in a time that, that, that we don't face today and, and, and so on. I want to tell you right now, the word of God is the same as of it today and forever. It is powerful. It was the word of God that produced light and brought the world into existence. Think about that. He spoke and it was. Isn't that marvelous? It is powerful. In Hebrews 11.3 it said, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, and so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. It is priceless. Many saints have given their very lives to protect and to pass on to us the word of God. We have no idea how blessed we are to have the Bible. Tyndale's last words. The last words before being strangled and burnt at the stake in 1536. 
This is what he said. Oh Lord, open the king of England's eyes. The martyrs' prayers were answered in 1539. King Henry VIII allowed the Bible in every parish church in England. And in, uh, and in 1611, King James ordered the Bible to be translated into a language that everyone could read. So here's a man. He's sentenced to death for his faith. He's, 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 he's tied to a picket with under him is all of the, the bush that is ready to be burned. And because they did not like what he was saying, they even strangled him. But even through all of that, words that came out where God opened the eyes of the king of England. You see, the word of God is powerful. In Romans 10, 17, it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We have to realize that many Christians will say they need faith. When the Bible says faith comes by the word. If we will discipline ourselves to the word of God, it would take so much of what we face and it would throw it out. Right. This world is full of words. Never let the words replace the word. Right. Amen. I believe when it says even the elect will be deceived if possible, I think it will come through you too. We have never had a media that is both blessed and curse. And what we need to realize by that is be careful little ears what you hear. When I flip it and it's a prophecy and I don't know that person, I just I'm not going there. I'm not going to listen to that. I want to hear the word of God. I want to hear what God has to say today to me. When the last when, when Trump was running, everybody was saying, you need to prophesy. I cannot prophesy what I do not hear from the Lord. I can hear others and say, well, I hope that's right, but I'm not going to base my life on it. I'm going to base my life on the Word of God. I don't know what this next election will hold, and I don't know where this country will be, but I know who holds tomorrow. Amen. I know who is faithful. I know who loves us. I know who's committed to us. I know who will lead us. I know who will protect us. I know who will keep us. It's Jesus. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. It's Jesus. We don't have to fear. We don't have to worry about what happens in Yemen. We don't have to worry. We know this one thing. God has me on his Richter scale. He has me in his sight. You know what the Lord says? You pray that it doesn't happen, but didn't I tell you that it has to happen before I come? You know that God chose you and he chose me for the end of the end times? That's exciting. Amen. It, it, it can be exciting to say, he, I was appointed for this very moment. And it looks like the world is falling apart. Anybody agree with it? There is wars and rumors of wars and and this, and now uh, Taiwan has just elected a, a president that's very liberal, and now is talking with China, and probably will try to make some kind of an agreement with China that doesn't in include war. I mean, we are living in strange times. The world, the world court has just, has just uh, um, pronounced Israel as a criminal. And now the UN is picking up that very charge in which to bring it to their court to call them criminals. Criminals for what? For protecting their girls from getting raped? 
protecting people. You see what I mean? The Bible says in the last day, they'll call good evil and evil good. So don't be alarmed by all this. The craziness in our politics. The, the foolishness and security. The Bible said all of these things will be. But he says, don't look up and what? Rejoice. For he said, time is at hand. And so what I share with you today is keep yourself in the word. In Psalms 119.11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. In Psalms 119, 7 through 10, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are mighty, rejoicing in the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eye. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, uh, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Yesterday we had a surprise guest on the radio that came with Sam, and he is uh, he speaks in Washington D.C. to to uh, politicians. And what his job is, is to try to bring people together who have disagreements. It's a very tough job, but he is skilled at it. And he sat there and he watched the radio program afterward and he said, I've learned so much from this. And afterward he said, I said, look, we're just simple manners. But you know, he said that he would make us wise. That we, if we would give our hearts to him, he said, I, I'm making wise the simple. And that man with his degrees and, and what he is doing in Washington, and, and he's going up in the White Mountains today to find the ghost of Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> Go find it. I don't want it. Young guy. <laughs> Pray for him. But the fact of it is, is Andrew, he, he listened to all the dialogue, he listened to everything, and he said after, he said, I am totally impressed. Because God takes the simple. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, 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 he can, and he can bring forth wisdom from the simple. So I, I ask you, didn't I? I say this, keep your eye on the word of God. Amen. Don't let stories, prophecies, and all those things cause you to wonder. I believe in prophecy. But I believe that prophecy has to be verbatim of this book. That's brilliant. What does the word say? And so we've got to be trusting in the word of God and trusting the Lord not our nation not our politicians not anyone else but God I trust you Lord Cora Tim Boom was led into the concentration camps her faith did not keep her from the camp but her faith kept her through it trust the Lord have peace with God receive his blessings he loves you, and he wants you to be at peace. Would you please stand with me? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There are so many voices in this world, even the voice of my own heart, that is not scriptural. And I have to continually speak to everything that's contrary to God's word. You have to speak to it. And we realize in this, Jesus didn't ignore the devil. He spoke. It is written. Are we willing to discipline ourselves to that place where, Lord, let my world, my life conform to you and not me to the world? Let's bow our heads if we would in prayer this morning.
Dear Lord, we pray. We're desperate. Lord, we need you. We know that without you, we can do nothing. Lord God, we need your word. And what is your word? John said it very well. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And we also find out in verse 14, Lord Jesus, that you are that word. And that word bled and died. That word, that's what purifies the human heart. God, let your word ever be true. Let us celebrate it and hold it up above every ambition, and every thought, and every direction. Let your word be true this morning. And let us love your word. And let us stay in your word. And we say it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I love every one of you. And I pray for you. We're living in a crazy, crazy time. But you know what? I have peace like a river in my soul. And that is in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. See, the enemy will come against you and he'll come against you with wrong attitudes. He'll come against you with all of his arsenal. That's what we've got to say, Lord. Lord, please. I want to please you. That's the highest thing that we can ever do, is please the Lord. And I ask each one of you to have that same goal. Lord, I want to please you. I want to please you. So I'm just praying. I want to say one more prayer, and I want to pray over you before we dismiss. Feel me, Father, I pray for those that are before me today. I thank you for each and every one of them. I thank you for the love that you have for each one. And Lord God, you have more desire for us to make it through than even sometimes we do. Father, you pray for us as you did Peter. In the word of God, I remember your saying, Peter, I have prayed for you. We know that you still pray as the high priest. You pray for your people. Lord God, I pray that our hearts would be molded, be shaped by your will. I pray that as we leave this house today, we will know that we've stood before you and that your word is etched in our hearts. And everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah. I don't know what to do right now. I just say, Lord, what would you have us to do? But I'm going to tell you this. Jesus loves you. He's patient. He's gentle. And he's kind. But we're coming to the end of the age real quick here. Hallelujah. How's this young boy needed? Oh, you got a squirrel. You like prayer? I won't go pray for your squirrel. Uh, no. But I will pray for you, young man. He's been asking if he can tell. He's been asking all through the service. Can tell you about Noah and Ark. No, you want to tell me? He wants prayer too, yeah. Yes. You told me about Noah and the Ark. Go ahead. Can you make a phone call about Noah and the Ark? Like, what is it about Noah and the Ark? They fright. Yeah. All right, I'll take that then and let's pray.